What's up, everybody? Uh, Monday Morning Analyst. My name is Luke Thomas. I'm the senior editor at MMAfighting.com. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're having a great day. I realize it's not the morning, uh, but um, the name works for the podcast, I suppose. All right. Uh, you guys know how this works. Three segments. We talk about the card and overview, drill down a little bit in the second part, and then the third part, we look ahead to see out uh, what's next. Uh, not a whole lot that happened this past weekend. Just one card. I'm going to pull it up here. Uh, UFC Fight Night 82. Oh, and by the way, if you're watching this, give it a thumbs up, like, share, comment on any social media channel. That'd be great. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, anyway, back to the card. Really just one event that happened this weekend, UFC Fight Night 82 and or however you want to call it based on your naming convention, UFC Fight Night, Hendricks versus Thompson. Um, the card overall, not so great. I'm going to give it a rating of about a C plus, B minus-ish in that area. You know, your mileage may vary. Um, UFC didn't put together a bad card. It just lacked a little bit of the kind of dynamism um, that you know that they can bring when, you know, certainly fights turn out a little bit better. Um, and, of course, they match up things that are a little bit more interesting. So um, some parts not their fault. Some parts eh, a little bit, but nothing too serious one way or the other. And um, a great showing in the main event. That obviously saved kind of, not saved it exactly, but, you know, ended it on a high note. Um, so, again, it was a headline in a welterweight contest by Stephen Thompson and Johnny Hendricks. Real quickly, let's talk about some of the math behind the card. It took place at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. The attendance, very low, 7,422. That is very, very low. Now, it was a fight night card. Obviously, we know if it had been a pay-per-view, probably would have been higher than this. They probably had to deal with some refunds, so, you know, factoring that in. But nevertheless, not a good number. Uh, for a gate, gate not bad, all things considered, 1.435 million. That's actually pretty good, um, given the attendance. That means the ticket prices were kind of high. You'll see that the UFC will do gates less than this, like 1.1, 1.2 mil for these Fox shows where they're filling out literally twice the amount of people. So um, keep that in mind. In Vegas, they, can, they tend to charge um, higher ticket prices. Um, and also, you know, because they're selling to the casinos itself. All right. So, Thompson and Hendricks uh, headline this card. Again, I'm going to give it about a C plus, B minus, d depending on what, you know, um, your mileage might be. I lean a little bit closer to C, but okay. Headline by Stephen Thompson taking on Johnny Hendricks. Stephen Thompson winning at 331 of the first round via TKO punches. Big John McCarthy was the referee in that contest. We're going to go into detail on this fight a little bit, so I don't want to say too much here. But I think for me, there's a couple things I want to say at the outset. Number one... Um, this fight reminded me a little bit, a little bit, of Rousey Holm. Because if you go back and you watch what Stephen Thompson did, there's not a whole lot of tape. The fight ended after three and a half minutes. But what you do see is that basically Thompson had prepared for, A, what he was going to do when his back was against the fence, and B, the forward pressure of Hendricks. Hendricks kept kind of marching him down a little bit. You could tell from the outset, and he actually at that one point closed the distance really well with those double right hooks. He actually connected on the second one, got Thompson up, Thompson up against the fence. So Thompson knew that this was coming, that he was going to walk him down. So he developed uh, a set of, I won't say rehearsed movements, but he had a, in his mind the kind of thing he needed to do to make sure that he kept the pocket open, that it was never got collapsed, that he was always working at the kind of angles he needed to, but more so that he had just some prepared counterattacks for that forward pressure. And we'll talk about some of them in, in, in specific detail, but that really was was the key to the whole thing. Um, there's it's, it's not much more complicated than that. Now, you can go and you can look at some of the striking sequences and choices that Thompson made, switching stances and whatnot, um, and obviously over time you'll see that very much confused him. In fact, the ending sequence you'll see really got to Johnny Hendricks, uh, again, which I'll show you here in just a minute. Um, but... Nevertheless, that that was sort of what I took away from it. I feel like, and I said this on on Saturday night, I feel like Stephen Thompson's a little Sage Northcuttish, and I mean it as a compliment. You know, athletic does these flips, comes from the karate background. But and you know, look when he made his debut against Matt Brown, I think it was against Matt Brown, if I recall correctly. I won't go into that story anymore because I've told it a thousand times. But let me just see. Uh, no, it was against Dan Stitchin. He made his debut. That was the head kick KO. Um, but then against Brown, against somebody really good, you know, he he came up short and he kind of got uh, 
uh, beat on a little bit. And he just has made such tremendous progress in his game. He must be so proud of himself. He absolutely should be. What a tremendous, tremendous talent. An incredible showing. Doing to Johnny Hendricks what no one's done to Johnny Hendricks. Johnny Hendricks just doesn't get beat like that. It looked to me like one person was playing checkers and one person was playing chess. You know, the kind of striking style that Johnny Hendricks has, at least the one he employed in this fight, because again, you know, you have to give him opportunity to rebound and maybe get better himself. It just seemed like it, it, that only works if someone accommodates you on those terms. Like you basically strike in the same kind of way that he does, and you just sort of meet in the middle, and the person who's a little bit sharper gets the edge. That was not what Thompson was doing. He wasn't playing that game at all. He didn't want to play that game. It, it wasn't of any kind of interest to him. He wanted to do a much different kind of game that ignored Hendricks trying to put that kind of that style of striking contest on his terms and more than that I just feel like uh, the dynamism I mentioned this on Saturday night the dynamism and the movement and the constant surprise and um acuity of timing on Stephen Thompson wow go back and watch and watch how often he catches Hendricks on the half beat in between a step or right after a step before he's about to set off on another step as he's coming forward there's you can go back and you can look at the punches they're not exactly a whole lot of exotic choices there's a couple of them but a lot of them is just really setting off at an angle getting a good punch in, following it up with a hand, and then ultimate foot combination, but all of it being based off of variety and timing. The timing of everything on the half beat, I cannot stress it enough. It is it is sublime how good that was. Man, you give that guy some good takedown defense, you give that guy the ability to create separation, he's a nightmare. He's a nightmare. And that kind of style he has is really going to be benefited by a big octagon. You know, a little octagon, we'll see how well he can do because he'll have to, a lot more, I think, wrestling clinches to answer for. And, and who knows if he can wilt under that or not. But for this, man, all that open spacing, knowing your opponent's going to come forward and just having so many answers for it, he looked sensational. Wow. And you know what? Credit to Johnny Hendricks after the fight going up there and saying, look, he just beat me. Weight cut wasn't an issue. Change of camp wasn't an issue. Nothing. This guy was just better. What a professional Johnny Hendricks is. Incredible. I take my hat off to both competitors, and you know what? I know Johnny Hendricks will be back. He's got a long road ahead in terms of uh, being where he needs to, um, and we'll see what's next for the title shot in terms of Wonder Boy Thompson, but always great to see two pros, and even though one didn't have a great fight, um, you know, I, I just respect Johnny Hendricks for doing what he did there. All right, in the co-main event, I'm not even going to talk about this. Roy Nelson defeated Jared Rochalt, 30-27, 30-27, and 29-28. Arguably one of the worst fights UFC's ever put on in the modern era. Just a disaster. Rochalt having very little opportunity to do anything because he has very little you know, uh, ability at this point to create a lot of offense. A little bit from dirty boxing, um, but did a lot of just sort of basically running out of the pocket to stay away. Roy Nelson kind of hunched down the whole time, uh, anticipating a shot or... You know, just trying to find a way to make sure he can get his hips behind him. And it was just, it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. Uh, Ovin St. Pru defeated Rafael Cavacanti, 30-27, 30-27, then 29-28. Interesting and weird fight. Uh, St. Pru appeared to have, you know, rolled or injured his foot and ankle in the first round. Um, Cavacanti doing well with leg kicks and then basically abandoning them. And then St. Pru finding a way to... to um, you know, blitz himself a little bit, but then mostly get on top and work grounded pound and keep Feijiao there. Feijiao there, not really going for submissions, doing a lot of covering up, a little bit of knee shielding, um, but not really using a dynamic guard. And if you're not going to use a dyna dynamic uh, dynamic guard, you should be getting on your feet, you know. Just bizarre choices for game plan. Not that oh, Sam Pru looked bad by any stretch. And again, he was probably a little hobbled, but you kind of felt like, I don't know if Cavacanti can win, but I know he can do better than this. I've seen him in this fight do better than this you know for a guy who had wins over King Mo and and um I always forget the other guy he beat oh Romero you know you just feel like post USADA or whatever else kind of mitigating factor you want to introduce in that fight you just felt like I know you got more ability than this chasing down strikes and then kind of just basically covering up underneath when you got taken down I don't know it just wasn't it just was a very very bizarre fight in that way but you know St. Prue um continues to improve, and this was a learning experience for him, and, and we'll see what he can do. 
Joseph Benavidez defeating Zach Makovsky, 30-27, 29-28, 29-28. You know, Makovsky had some interesting wrestling entries. He would turn one way for a takedown, then turn on a dime on the other, right? Get guy, get a guy going one way to commit his weight and then switch the angle on him. That was pretty impressive. And, you know, he stayed with it in the best way that he could. But that fight was going to be won or lost probably in some kind of wrestling um attack or a series of wrestling attacks because on the outside Mikovsky has a good jab he's got good striking but he was at a real speed disadvantage there and of course you saw his left eye begin to swell um as time went on so that kind of I think hindered his ability to see what was coming and, and didn't make that um you know uh, a, a real avenue for opportunity he has a wrestling background he's purple ball under Marcelo Garcia so that was really what his best chance was going to be. And he has, you know, look, he's talented there. It's not like he doesn't have some ability, but Joseph Benavidez is so good about, uh, at, at one thing that doesn't get enough credit. People call him a good scrambler, and he is. He is good at breaking his opponent's hands apart. Really, really talented. Or creating enough space to just escape even if their hands are connected. But he's really good at just breaking the kind of building blocks you need for any other kind of takedown or forms of control. To be established. Joseph Benavidez is a phenomenal scrambler and excellent at breaking hand control. Really, 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 really good at that. Now, where he goes from here, I don't know. Kind of interesting that he fought Zach Murkowski, a very credentialed fighter, um, on the same night where Cejudo got the nod for the title shot against champion Demetrius Johnson, which makes sense, of course, in its own way, but you just wonder what's next for Benavidez. 125, he's great. Um, I don't know how... I, here's what I would say, and maybe you have a different response to this, but for me, when you watch that fight, you certainly walk away and you say, wow, Joseph Benavidez still seems quick and as athletic and a uh, phenomenal scrambler as ever. Um, and, you know, he's got a big punch, too. Did you see anything in there that led you to believe a third fight with Demetrius Johnson would be different? Personally speaking, I did not. Maybe you did. Uh, this fight was <laughs> crazy. Misha Serkunov taking on Alex Nicholson. They called it a neck crank here on Wikipedia. This is uh, at 128 of the second round. Boy, what a vice grip on this barbarian, huh? So he had the bicep on one side and then the forearm on the other side on the jaw, and then he gable grips, and as he gable grips, he, you notice he didn't lean in. He yanked over to the side, so that's probably why they're calling it a neck crank. It's more just a jaw break, you know, awful pain threshold testing kind of submission. You know, you see a lot of guys... They'll get. They'll try and secure the neck, and if they are the neck, and if they can't because they're on the jaw, um, you know they'll try and wiggle down. And if they can't, they let it go. You, if you've ever rolled, man, you know there's just there's one hulking monster who doesn't really need that. If he can get it on your jaw, he will just break it. He'll just break it. And uh, Serkunov, or, or however you pronounce it properly, Serkunov, it just seems like one of those guys. Um, really great, by the way, at establishing a high inside control with a big big he had like a big left underhook against the fence could do a lot with it um seems to be very strong with his grips i noticed his gripping was giving nicholson a lot of problems um and i thought he had a real patient game plan i'd like to see him be a little bit more athletically mobile to the extent that that's possible for someone who has his size and weight and age but um you know certainly used an economy of motion to to reserve some of his energy and and just overwhelmed slowly Alex Nicholson. Nicholson had a lot of, um, I think I think it was the favorite heading into this, and I was very surprised by that. I knew he was talented, no doubt about it, but Serkunov, while having some historical deficiencies standing up in terms of his defensive responsibility, um, I just felt like if he could make close quarter contact with Nicholson, this was his fight to lose, and certainly that was that was the case. Mike Pyle defeating Sean Spencer, TKO elbows and knees at 425 of the third round. Man, this was a tough fight for Mike Pyle. Forty years old, had the Tennessee was it, what was he called the Tennessee um, waterfall for that mullet. Uh, you got to just respect him. A lot, a lot of good things you could say here. Again, I, I was also surprised by this. Sean Spencer had has had some hype as a guy who's got really good striking, and he does have really good fundamentals. If you just keep your eyes on him and you watch him, everything he does seems clean and poised and great, you know. But there's just not a lot of damage that he inflicts. There's not a lot of punishment he lays out. And for a guy like that to go up against Mike Pyle, who is, you know, the longer you let a guy hang around like that, who's got a ton of tricks and can turn the fight on a dime based on different things he can do, Dangerous, man. Dangerous. And you saw that. He couldn't get the guillotine. He used it to flip and roll him over. That's the trademark textbook move. He did it flawlessly. And then at the end there, he did what I call standing ground and pound, where if you can get a guy hurt against the fence and all he can really do is peek through his hands, you know, to, to keep an eye on you and, 
you saw Pyle going side to side, up and down, brutalizing him with with ground and pound against the fence like that. A guy may not go down, but you can do significant damage doing something like that. You saw that too. So, you know, great use of elbows, great use of knees, great combinations between them. Just Mike Pyle has a lot of different answers, but I think that's my knock on Sean Spencer, man. Great technique, good hustle. He's got strong focus on what he wants to do. You can tell he comes in with a game plan. You can tell he tries to follow it. Just not a lot of steam on the punches, enough to affect change. You move now to the prelim card. This was still on Fox Sports 1. Josh Berkman taking on KJ Nunes. He wins across the board, 30-27, 30-27, 30-27. Uh, strong performance by Berkman, even though he was kind of getting tired there at the end. Um, good fight for him at lightweight. I don't wonder. How, I mean, he said he had to cut an astronomical amount of weight, uh, 18 pounds in like 24 hours to make that. I'm not sure how healthy that is. But uh, a decent first showing there. KJ Nunes, you know, just another guy who... He's if you can find the right matchup for him, man, he can just bomb on people. But he's kind of got one gear, and he, if he can't get out of it, you know, um, he has some trouble. Derek Lewis defeating Damian Grabowski TKO punches at two seventeen of the first round. This was another one I thought was kind of surprising. I think Grabowski was the favorite here. I didn't understand that. Certainly, he has some submission ability, but that it was going to be predicated on the takedown. Now, I'll be I'll admit that I was a little bit uh, pleasantly surprised by the takedown defense of uh, Derek Lewis. You saw that um, there was one takedown attempt. Lewis got his hips back, and when he and when he sprawled, he pancaked flat to the mat, hips facing the mat. This was textbook. This was perfect. He did a great job, you know. Uh, I don't know how many of those he has in him over the course of a fight against someone who can keep the attack going, but certainly he had enough here. And I'm telling you, man, this guy can create havoc in an instant. One punch gets guys rethinking their entire life outlook. Derek Lewis hits like a ton of bricks, man. And when he comes down, people are just like, oh, this is not what I anticipated this feeling like. I think even guys who know he hits hard, once they feel it, they're like, I need to, I need, he, he makes guys make bad choices. He makes guys make desperate choices. And if he can do enough to add to that, by which I mean positionally shut you down to keep these things going. Wow, look out. He is a nightmare. He's a total nightmare. I even asked uh, on Twitter, is he the hardest puncher in MMA? And some folks agreed, some folks didn't. You can have a debate. I don't I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but some people were saying Anthony Johnson. Here's an idea for a fight. Anthony Johnson at heavyweight versus Derek Lewis. Now tell me that wouldn't be fun. You could say, well... Even if both guys hit as hard, Johnson would be quicker, and I believe you. But it would be interesting to see Johnson have to face somebody who can punch as hard as he can. Now, that would probably lead Johnson to do what he did against Dan Hardy, which is to wrestle. Okay, so maybe it won't work. But I'm just trying to think of some permutations about you know having a guy like Derek Lewis have to face somebody else like him where both guys have to th- face the threat of the knockout happening at any point. Uh, Justin Scoggins, now this was a great performance. Taking on Ray Borg, he wins by unanimous de- decision, 30-27 on two scorecards, and then 30-26. Justin Scoggins looking fantastic, man. I was a little bit worried. There were a couple losses, particularly a Dustin Ortiz loss, and, and that was close, but, um, you know, and I didn't expect the, I think he lost to John Moraga, too, if I'm not mistaken. I think he got submitted by Moraga, if I'm not, if I'm, if I am thinking correctly. Let me just verify that. Yeah, he got submitted by Moraga. Came back against Sampo and Borg. So he's beaten in the UFC now. Uh, Vichilic, Campuzano, who's no longer there. I don't think Vichilic is even more there either. Sampo and Borg. Lost to Moraga and Ortiz. You know, what that tells me is he obviously can beat guys in that division. He can beat good guys in that division. Ray Borg, I thought, he didn't look bad necessarily. Just fought a guy who's a little bit better than him. But Scoggin's doing everything he, did, he needed to. You know, the only issue with him that he needs to work on, and he noted this too. It's not, I'm not saying anything he's not aware of. The, the decisions. He's getting a lot of decisions. Even when he loses, they're still they're still going along. So this is my point about, about um, Scoggins. Would like to see him find a way to, to just hurt people a little bit more, make them be a little bit more desperate in control positions. And that's going to be harder to do at flyweight than any other weight. You, know, you go back and you say, what's the difference between the way Scoggins fought and the way Thompson fought? I mean, a few things, of course. Thompson's going to hit a lot harder. Uh, but I think a big difference is that guys have trouble closing the distance on Thompson, not merely because of his use of distance, but because they're a little bit slower at welterweight than they are at flyweight. At flyweight, these guys can just get a hold of each other so quickly that they spend a lot of time just trying to pry one guy off of them 
before the striking even begins again. That's very, very hard to do, to, to be a finisher in that division if that's that's the way people fight. Um, if you want to wrestle in above the waist control positions, it's just going to be difficult to get separation enough times to land on someone, to bomb on them. And, you know, at 125, they're not necessarily as heavy-handed as they are at, you know, 170 pounds. So so that's going to be a tough thing for Scoggins to do. But, I, man, if he can add a little certain, you know, lethality to his striking, look out. I thought he had great takedown defense. I thought he had a nice, diverse, confusing arsenal of strikes. I thought he had mostly pretty good use of distance. I thought he had great, great, uh, uh, you know, threatening the pass on top, taking the back. Just a complete uh, performance by Justin Scoggins. Uh, Diego Rivas defeated Noad Lahat via KO, flying knee, vicious knockout. Second time Lahat has eaten it. I don't know what his issue is there, but it's not a good one. Mickey Gall defeated Mike Jackson. Rear naked choke at 45 seconds into the first round. This was on the fight pass portion of the card. Um, not a lot to say about this one except, uh, look, I don't know what level Mickey Gall is at. There's just no way to tell. 2-0 doesn't tell you a whole lot. Seems like he's pretty good for the level that a 2-0 fighter should be. Um, still don't think he should be in the UFC, but, you know, he is out here to prove himself, and I respect that. He, he even said, I don't think this fight proves anything. I'm going to prove myself. I like his attitude. I think that's the right attitude you have to have if you're 2-0. You know at 2-0, you got a lot of work to prove to, to be a contender in the UFC if you can even do it at all. So that he is aware of that I think is a great sign. Um, I would also say, uh, look, brown belt jiu-jitsu didn't do anything wrong. But just to make a quick point, look, fights can go to decisions at any level of MMA. Fights can end quickly at, at any level of MMA. But if you've watched a lot of UFC and you go to a lot of regional shows, there's something you know, namely... Typically speaking, the fights at a regional level show, they end a lot quicker. And I think for some of the reasons you see here, one, it could be, you know, we don't respect the fact that some of these guys make it to the UFC on ability, but they also make it on the fact that in addition to their ability, they can take a shot better than some. That's just a fact. I think there's also the issue of just how matchmaking works on regional shows. You'll get a guy who is 0-0 and takes on a guy who's 1-0, and and maybe that 1-0 is a brown belt. Maybe that 0-0 is like a four-stripe white or, you know, brand new blue belt or something like that. And you just get these massive disparities in talent, which is kind of, I think, what you saw here a little bit. Um, so that can be a contributing factor. There's any kind of factors that, just generally speaking, you see a lot more quicker finishes um, on the regional th side of things. And this was kind of like that. Again, plenty of UFC fights have ended in 45 seconds or less. Conor McGregor, Jose Aldo, chief among them. But typically speaking, they're going to end like this. Uh, and then Alex White defeated Artem Lobov, or Lobov, 30-27 uh, across the board. Better job by Alex White, um, getting out of the way of big strikes, um, a little bit of head movement, keeping his feet busy. He's got a long way to go because he was kind of a pocket brawler before, and I don't think he realized that's a path to anywhere, and he's trying to change that. So he's a, a, a work in progress. We'll see where he can go with it. But a good first step, good first test, actually, to try and get the training wheels off of his new um, – his new way of competing on the feet. So uh, credit to him. Uh, fighter of the card, easy call, Stephen Thompson. So let's do this. We looked at the fight card overall. Not a whole lot that stands out except that main event. I want to talk a little bit more about it now. Let's do that. All right, so look, uh, this is one of those fights where I really wish I had access and, and the rights to use footage for a fight because there's just so many things in a short amount of time that Steven Thompson does so well, man. Golly. But I can't. Uh, let me just emphasize real quickly. You have to go back and watch the fight. Because only when you're watching the fight can you really appreciate all the details. How often he switches stances. Why he's switching stances. The variety of strikes. Nothing is ever doubled up um, in a way where it's predictable. If he hits you from one side, he switches stances and then completely changes it to the other, back to back. There's also how good and how disciplined he is at maintaining the pocket, always setting himself at the right angle that he needs to. We'll talk a little bit about that. I just mean the fluidity of it, the virtuosity of it. Go back and watch the fight and pay attention to, to all these things. I'm going to highlight just a couple of them here, um, and then we'll get back to it. So this is early on. Give some credit to Johnny Hendricks. He actually does a really good job of cage cutting. Not just moving laterally, but then laterally and then at an angle, a closing off angle. And he does it and gets Hendricks against the fence here. Probably the best thing he did the entire fight, if I'm being honest. Um, 
And this is why I thought I was like, wow, right off the right off the break, he was able to cut off the cage. I was kind of surprised. He's not able to after this, but this is why the first and only good thing he really does in the fight. Again, I'm not here to bash him. I'm just saying what didn't go his way. So you see, you have you have Wonder Boy here with the overhook, and he's got an underhook on the other side. So let's watch what happens here. This is just so important to me. Now you've got Wonder Boy here trying to be on his feet. Um, what's interesting is he's going back and forth with his right hand between a whizzer and a just a hook around the head. Either way, he's still basically keeping Johnny Hendricks off of his back, although less so here. But I think what happened was that he was getting pushed forward so hard with the wizard, it was creating pressure on the back of his shoulder. So he kind of goes back and forth. As long as the head is covered, uh, you're probably okay. And what you can see Hendricks doing with his right hand is he's trying to lift and turn the hips of Wonder Boy Thompson, right? Because if you think about it, if he's at an angle or his hips are facing the mat, it's no good. But if you can get his back facing the mat, even if he's got that wizard, you could probably overrun him or pull him off at an angle or something. So you see Wonder Boy using that left hand to keep himself up. You see him with the uh, semi overhook in this case, semi not, not so much a wizard, but preventing his back from being taken. And he's doing a really good job of not letting his hips get rotated out and around so, so towards you, like if they were coming this way or out out and around. And here you see him um, basically the same position. So this is a different angle from about three seconds later. And you can see, the, look at the right arm here. He's trying to pull the hips out as he's driving forward. Now you've got Wonder Boy back on that whizzer a little bit, making sure his back doesn't get taken. Um, but just sort of noting here what's what's happening here. Hendrick's doing a good job of putting pressure forward with this arm, pulling it out, trying to turn him, trying to overrun this arm a little bit to, to if you know if your arm is out in front of you you can hold it if it's kind of underneath you it kind of collapses right if you try to do a push-up try doing a push-up with your hands over your stomach it won't it won't quite work a little you know, all that well but you know wonder boy does a really good job so here you see he's able to wrestle this kind of leg free what he winds up doing is he brings his knee over and around the top of the wrist of hendrix and he gets it to the ground now hendrix is still kind of all over him really pressing into him here um, you know, he, so he's not not doing a bad job, but he's not uh, certainly Hendricks. Excuse me, I should say certainly Thompson is slowly building his way towards the structure he needs um, to get to his feet and create separation. But you can still see off the toes here, Hendricks. He's driving in, and there's good head pressure here too. Although he's his head is above, it's going to be a little bit harder to generate the kind of pressure that you want. Um, so watch this. He goes back to the wizard. You see that? The, the right arm here of, of Thompson? Because he realizes if the Hendricks can just shuck him by, drive him forward a little bit, um, he'll get behind him. And that's that's bad news. So he goes. He did a really good job of going back and forth to the head to the wizard. I was very impressed by Stephen Thompson. There's like little details like this on his wrestling. You can tell. Um, he just has a, he has a lot more fluidity and a lot more answers. And more than that, he has comfortability in these positions now. He can make adjustments that he needs to make to relieve pressure, to find the right balance, to make sure he's maintaining control. He can go back and forth between them, all while doing what he needs to, which is now you see he has both feet on the floor. And what was interesting was, um, let's go to another slide here. What Thompson did was, Thompson kind of reached, you don't really see it here, but he was using um, this arm here to kind of punch up a little bit, which made Hendrix want to say, oh, I'm going to establish inside control. But if you establish inside control, you've already got the other hand here occupied. You go back to the wizard and now you stand because both of his hands are occupied. They're not they're not on your legs or your feet or your ankles anymore. So now he begins to stand. So this is where we are. Good head pressure here by Johnny Hendrix. Now what he's doing here is he's kneeing constantly. Mostly this near side leg. I think a little bit to the outside leg. But you see he's driving pressure. He's got the underhook. Still the wizard here um, for Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. But this is where it gets really interesting. So if, previously what you'll see is... You, well, I'll just start it here. What you see is this. This arm here. He's going to establish inside control. He's got the wizard here. He's got inside control here. What he's waiting for is this. What you're going to see is you're going to see the right leg of Hendrix take a step, small step, half step even, back. He's going to use that left leg to drive in, right? But what's going to happen is before the left leg of Hendrix even hits the ground, Thompson is on the move. Here's the point. Remember I told you in the first segment how good the timing was of Steven Thompson. That's not just true for at range striking you on the half beat. That's true for this position too. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the comfortability of the position 
for Stephen Thompson. So watch this. This is so cool. What he does here is, go back and look at the feet. Uh, the feet doesn't slide too much. You see him battering the knees, right? Or battering the thigh to the extent possible. All right, a little more of the same. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. Look here. You can see he took a slight step back with this one as he's driving this. What Thompson winds up doing is with this inside control, he does a few things. One, before the foot even comes down, and again, you have to see the video in slow motion to appreciate it. What he's going to end up doing is this inside control he's going to use to push off. He's going to use it to create space. That's the first thing he's going to do. What he also did with the wizard was as this leg drove in and then drove back out as he was bringing the leg back out, Thompson used it to right the posture of Johnny Hendricks a little bit. You go back to the first couple slides, you see how kind of dug in he is? Now he's a little more, more upright. He's even more upright. His head's kind of leaning, but look how much different his body is. There's not as much weight on him, right? And that's what he's going to use to get this arm out, this other arm. And, and, and essentially, his hips, are, excuse me, his hips and his shoulder blades are against the fence, and now he's going to whip out the side he almost wrapped in the head in case he wanted to turn didn't quite have to use it you'll see he kind of lets it go but then uses it to push away but here's my point about this everything about this is so critical because it's super technical from all the different points he has to hit to make it work but the timing is so critical go back and watch on video before the left foot of johnny hendrix has hit the mat wonder boy is on the move he times everything perfectly he does not wait for you to create stable pressure structures he waits for you to offload some of that weight that you don't that you need to or that he thinks he needs to move but as the weight becomes off he feels it gets an underhook away excuse me that overhook gets an overhook away uses the inside pressure here to push off wrap his wrap his right arm on the outside again you, if you want that right hand would be better if he was twisting Hendricks into the fence. He's not really. He's just using himself to move out of the way, and then he gets away. Just just a brilliant job by Johnny Hendricks. Again, I, this is one of those things where I really wish I had the video. But before that left leg even comes down, you can see here the left leg, the arm's already moving when the left leg is already down, but just just take my word for it. The precision of this, I think, really caught Hendricks off guard. The timing is absolutely perfect. All right, so now we move on. And by the way, we always talk about what's the key for any kind of striker. It's not merely digging an underhook or digging a whizzer and getting your hips to the side of the fence, not flat, and then hanging out and then kind of just holding position. It's getting away. Because one thing Stephen Thompson does well after this is finding himself in the center of the cage over and over again. Here was another cool thing he did just in terms of variety. So he loves that right leg. Either he stands with his right leg forward or he stands... Um, He'll stand in southpaw with his right leg back, and then he'll use that to a different variety of kicks. Um, he'll use it for a rear leg front kick. He'll use it for a middle kick. He'll use it for um, a head kick. A a any number of different things he uses it for. When that right leg is forward, you see him do like a front leg side kick to the chest, a little bit parried by um, Hendricks, but not much. So then they separate, and you see Hendricks close the distance. As he does, Mr. Thompson here varies things up, and hits him in the head with a, with a front leg sidekick. A different variety that he never saw coming. Might have even been a hook kick a little bit. But in any case, just never saw it coming. Walked back in thinking, I'll, I'm expecting the same kind of weapons or some close variety thereof. And again, as we talked before, a little rousey, homish. He knew that this guy was closing the distance, so he just created another a trap and opportunity for himself. Keep going. Here, we're at 325. Actually, I'm going to skip that. Let's go to 228 here. Um, so this is a little bit later. This is a, again, there's so many other things Thompson's doing well. I'm only going to highlight a couple of things. Here's another thing he does well. Here you can see him bouncing. Uh, you can look at him. You can see his, I mean, this one's barely touching the ground. This one's not touching the ground at all. Really good job by him. Um, so what you're going to see is he, as Hendricks moves forward, Thompson is backing up and then going side to side at the same time, like never really letting himself get put in one direction because what he wants to do is hop out at an angle. And you see that he's not quite so far up that, um, you know, he's he's really deep inside, but, you know, he had a six inch reach. He's got lead foot dominance, at least in terms of the angle. Here's my point. When, when Hendricks marches forward, what Thompson winds up doing is backing up and then leaping out at an angle. And as he leaps out of the angle, he cracks him with the right hand. So Thompson just essentially waits for Hendricks to set up the opportunity. And then he bangs on him. 
We keep going. It's happened again. Look at that lead foot dominance. Who's got it? I mean, his foot, the left foot of Thompson is almost camouflaged. Exact same punch. Bang. Right hand. You can see it just driving across the face of Johnny Hendricks here. This is another time where Hendricks tries to follow up. You can see, look, look at this guy on, his, on the balls of his feet here. Brilliant, isn't this guy? You can see Hendricks. Look how off balance he is after he swings on a right. And you can just see the cocked arm. Look at his, look at the eyes of Thompson downfield the whole way, as I like to say, like quarterbackish. The right hand misses. Thompson just lights him up with a right hand. And what you'll see he do is he cracks him with the right hand and doesn't just back out straight. He'll turn again this way. This right foot will keep pushing over to the right counterclockwise, and he'll hit him with another right hand. Boom, that's the second of the two. You can see here, if 146, he misses, he cracks him, resets the angle, and drills him again. I mean, you can see, look how different his foot position. You can't even see the UFC Fight Pass ad here. And then he comes around, bang, look at that, clean, resetting the angle. So this is my point. You, you, you often saw him say, I want to keep him at the ends of my hand, hands and feet. I want to keep him at the end of my hands and feet, blah, 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 over and over again. Well, that's what he means, sliding in the pocket, making sure it stays open, stays open at his range, not Johnny Hendricks's, and that he's always got the right angle. Even when he wants to throw a punch, he doesn't try to punch him as he, meets, as, as he comes in. He sets off, and even if this had missed, where is his back? Not against any fence, so he sets himself up. Even if it hadn't worked, he'd still be in a good position to get away if he needed to. Just, just so much going right for Stephen Thompson here. So this is kind of the end. This is a really interesting uh, uh, thing to note. Um, again, you can see he's got the leaf foot dominance. But what happened here is Hendricks is pretty hurt at this point. And what Thompson does is Thompson kind of faints a little bit, like, like almost like a, if you ever had a staring contest with your brother and you and you make a sudden motion forward like your forehead and your chest and you're like what are you gonna do what are you gonna do it was almost like one of those kinds of motions and you see Hendricks bite on it he, he brings his hands down like please stop hitting me what was so interesting about this look at the stance he's got a right-handed stance that's the deadly leg of, of Thompson Thompson doesn't do a whole lot here in terms of following up on the feint he doesn't try and punch him here he had been punching him so what does he do he actually changes stances and then goes for the turning back kick <laughs> and 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 I think at this point, not only is Hendricks hurt, he's just like, I don't know what's coming next. I don't know what's coming next. So I want to point out, he's in this right-handed stance. I don't get the what he what he does almost in slow motion is he'll turn to a southpaw stance and then does the turning back kick. Crazy, right? And this this time landing with the lead leg, uh, the, in this case the left leg. So this hurts Hendricks. But one thing you'll see that Thompson does is if he hits you with one kind of stance. Um, he'll switch a lot, or if he misses with that stance, he'll stand and then switch like immediately after. He does a lot of switching in between. So if he hits you, switch. Hits you, switch. Hits you, switch. So you'll see uh, he switched, hit him, stayed in this one, and then bombs on him again with that right. Remember, it's the same right hand he's been catching him with over and over again. Now this one kind of misses, but it ends up being a range finder. You see Johnny Hendricks is just like, I'm just trying to create space and get away. Now look who's doing all the cage cutting. It's Stephen Thompson. And then um, I want to show you here. Oh, by the way, let's, let's go back. Remember this one? Remember this off-balance shot here? Check this out. So this is that same punch. Look at me. Look how off-balance he is. It's just crazy. Look at the eyes of Stephen Thompson downfield the whole time. Cracks him. Now watch him reset the angle here. Boom. Look at this. Look at that Bud Light ad. Look at the Metro PCS ad. Look where his feet are here. I mean, you could just see. Look at the extension on that punch he's got. And he's just driving into it, right? And then turns the corner. So what you see him do is he kind of scoots his hips out. He doesn't. He punches here, and then he's going to rotate out this way, this way. He's going to bring this left shoulder back. He's going to rotate that one in the inside. Boom. And then cracks him again. And that's the point where Hendricks sort of fades against the fence and, and goes away. This is, uh, remember this punch here? All right, so he turns him, tries to catch him with the right. This one catches him a little bit. It's actually the left. And that's this punch right here. That's that left hand I'm talking about. Bang. You see that? I mean, it turns his head all the way sideways. And at that point, he basically collapsed. And you go back. So here's my point about Stephen Thompson. Again, number one, I'm going to say it, uh, uh, it's the most important thing. It's the number one priority. Go back and watch the fight because you can only really appreciate it with true video. I'm sorry I don't have it. I don't have the rights to it. I can't use it. I just want to show you a couple of things. I want to show you how comfortable 
Stephen Thompson was against the fence, all the different choices he was able to make, how sensational his timing was, not just in takedown defense, but at, at, at range in terms of just making sure he knew when to go, when not to go, how good he was at establishing the pocket, how excellent he was at using his range, how good he was at keeping his back off the fence. For the most part, he got caught here, but after that, that was it. He made all the adjustments he needed to how good he was at creating angles, how well he had anticipated the forward attack and movement of Johnny Hendricks, a, a sensational performance by Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, the best I've ever seen of him. My hat goes off to him. How can you not be impressed with this guy? Stephen Thompson, salute to you, sir. All right, last and not least, segment three. Let's just take a look at what's coming up ahead. Uh, it turns out for the next weekend, not a whole lot really. It's going to be in two weekends where things really begin to kick off. So if you go back and you, uh, excuse me, if you look here, the next major one is actually going to be the Bellator event. Bellator 149, Shamrock versus Gracie. I don't know what you want to say about that. Co-main event, Ferguson versus uh, Defeer Harris, a.k.a. Dada 5000. Nothing to really say about that either. Uh, Emmanuel Newton taking on Linton Vassal, the two guys who lost in the first round of the light heavyweight, um, um, not the 10-pole show, but the um, Dynamite show. Uh, Emmanuel Sanchez taking on Daniel Pineda, a tough fight for Sanchez, an important one as well. Belvin Galar taking on Derek Campos, and Justin Wren versus Juan Torres. Um, that is not a great card, but we're going to be there to cover it, only because I feel like it's important to cover it. Um, for the UFC, there's going to be a card on the 21st, which I believe is a Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. Let me verify that. February 21st, 2006. That should be a Sunday. Is it not? Yes, it is. So that is going to be at Pittsburgh. Cowboy versus Cowboy. It's going to be interesting. Derek Brunson taking on Hoan Carnero. Interesting fight. Cody Garbrandt, John Lineker. Great fight. Uh, Dennis Bermudez, Tatsuya Kawajiri. That could be that could be crazy unless Kawajiri tries to wrestle a lot. Uh, Thatch taking on C.R. Bahadur Azara. That should be fun. James Krause, Shane Campbell. Alex Garcia versus Sean Strickland. Joe Riggs versus Chris Camozzi. Daniel Serafian taking on Oluwale uh, Bangbose. I can't pronounce this guy's name. I can't at all, but he's actually a pretty good guy. I think out of Henzo's team. Um, don't, don't hold me to that. Trevor Smith, Hot Sauce, taking on Leonardo Augusto uh, Guimarães. Marion Renault is back against Ashley Evan Smith. Sarah Morris taking on Lauren Murphy. Anthony Hamilton. Shamil Abdurrahmanov. Excuse me. Shamil Abdurrahimov, uh, and then Jonathan Webb taking on Nathan Coy. So there's a couple interesting bouts here, particularly that main card is some good stuff. Uh, it's hit or miss on the preliminary and then the fight pass card. Uh, I apologize for, uh, I want to make sure he is out of Henzo's. Let me do that real quickly. I could be wrong about that. In fact, I very much am likely to be. Oluwale Bang Bose, I think is how you pronounce it. No, they say he's at a shoot to box C1 MMA. Interesting. Yeah, I, I botched that. Oh, this is the guy who lost to Uriah Hall already. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, so this will be his second fight in the UFC. This is the return of Daniel Serafian. And he has not fought since... I don't know. doesn't matter. In any event. Those are your two next big events, so look forward to the Donaldson running return. And actually, at Welterweight, that should be kind of fun, and we'll see how things go. So, if you have any questions or comments, challenges, emails, uh, you can send them luke.thomas at sbnation.com. You can follow me on Twitter at sbnlukethomas. Really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it around. And until next time, enjoy the fights.